This past April, I released what would go on to become one of my most successful videos ever, Aftonbuilt, the fall of a FNAF fan game. In it, I relayed statements obtained in an interview with Aftonbuilt's project lead, Jelly Liam. In addition to providing a summary of his experience working on the game, Liam also provided a few subjective opinions that were somewhat critical and dismissive of Scott and the fanverse as a whole. While my video was very well received, and the overwhelming response was sympathetic towards Liam and his team, there were some who were unhappy. They felt that Liam's statements had harmed FNAF or the fanverse, and that he had acted improperly by being so critical whilst speaking on the record in an interview. Thankfully, the controversy died down maybe a day or two later, and that was basically it. Unfortunately, Aftonbuilt project lead Jelly Liam recently released tweets implying that I had acted improperly during my interview with him back in April. He even went so far as to imply that I had tried to bribe him or something. I had a panic attack when I first saw Liam's tweets. I felt that I had been incredibly accommodating to him throughout the production of the Aftonbuilt video, and I was completely blindsided and crushed that he would launch these deceptive, misleading attacks on me, seizing on a completely unrelated controversy in order to win some imaginary internet points. I went to check our Discord conversation only to find that Liam had deleted nearly every message he had ever sent to me. The only messages that remained were the ones that he included in his screenshots, his own statements selectively deleted and my statements shown out of context in an attempt to make me look bad. The mere fact that all Liam's messages are deleted yet all of mine are still there is pretty telling unto itself, but I can prove that Liam's insinuation that I attempted to bribe him or acted improperly at all is simply not true. I hate that I feel compelled to make this video at all. It sucks to have to defend myself only a few weeks after making a genuine apology that I still stand by. I've deliberately been avoiding making a video like this, and I certainly don't want to drag up old and settled controversies. I'm also not interested in making a video that's just crapping all over someone, even if they did just crap all over me. However, out of context statements of mine are being passed around and deceptively used to attack me, and I know that I'm capable of proving my innocence. While I've tried my best not to throw anyone under the bus with this video, I do have to defend myself from what is absolutely a deliberately misleading representation of my statements, and I acknowledge that a lot of the evidence that I'm about to put forth doesn't make Jelly Liam look very good. However, I still feel obligated to show you all what really happened during that interview, the production of my Aftonbuilt video, and the aftermath. I encourage you to examine the evidence that I put forth yourself, as I am confident that it will prove beyond any reasonable doubt that these insinuations against me are completely unfounded. While Liam recently deleted most of his messages, I fortunately took screenshots of our conversation shortly after it happened. I intend to prove that I never acted inappropriately whatsoever during this interview, and furthermore, I will demonstrate that not only did I do nothing wrong, but that I went far beyond my journalistic and ethical obligations, all in an attempt to accommodate Liam as much as I reasonably could. I need to make one thing very clear first. While these deceptive allegations emerged in the wake of my controversial statements regarding Kane Carter, I am not defending the statements I made on that live stream. I take full accountability for those statements. Nobody made me say those things, I said them. That's on me and I have to deal with the consequences of my actions. Proving that I never mistreated or tried to bribe Liam doesn't somehow absolve me of my own unrelated statements, and nobody should take this video that way. I present to you the truth about Aftonbilt. In April of 2022, Aftonbilt appeared on Game Jolt. This very impressive Five Nights at Freddy's fan game demo was allegedly the proof of concept for a rejected fanverse initiative pitch that Scott ended up passing on. Immediately, I was fascinated. Most fan games are small, simple projects in the style of the classic FNAF games, not fully 3D Unreal Engine stuff that looks like this. Everyone was asking the same question. Why would Scott reject such a promising looking project? As an up and coming YouTuber that covers exactly this type of stuff, it was only natural that I set out to make a video on this exact topic. Let me be clear, I was going to make a video on Aftonbuilt no matter what, even if I wasn't able to interview anyone or get any exclusive info. However, on a whim, I reached out to Aftonbuilt community manager Notori Sky in hopes that I could get some more information. My channel was only like 4 months old, so I was surprised when, well, I'll just show you what happened. Hi, I understand you're really constrained in what you can say. This is me acknowledging their NDAs with Scott. Are you able to talk about your team and some general timeline stuff? Notori responded with, Liam just told me that he wants to talk to you personally. Jelly Liam was the project lead on Aftonbuilt as well as the Final Nights fan game series. I added him on Discord and our conversation began. I again immediately acknowledged that Liam was under NDA and was not at liberty to discuss certain things. I wanted to make it clear that if there was anything I asked about that he couldn't get into, that he should just no comment and I would move on. I can prove it. This is the beginning of my DM history with Jelly Liam. So I understand you're really constrained in what you can say, but I'm curious about some Aftonbuilt stuff that I think you probably could tell me. Liam responded, saying that he would attempt to spill as many beans as he was contractually allowed to. 
As our conversation went on though, Liam delved into more and more details, and I was somewhat taken aback. I had no idea that he had had such a negative experience corresponding with Scott, and I certainly didn't think he was going to throw so much shade on the fanverse as a whole, calling it a merch machine and insinuating that Scott had started the whole thing just to make a quick buck off the backs of fan game developers. No one could possibly have anticipated the interview going like that. This is Scott Cawthon we're talking about. He's a pretty wholesome dude. Everyone else who has worked with him speaks very highly of him. More shocking though was when Liam started telling me details about his negotiations with Scott. This immediately set off alarms in my head. It seemed like the kind of thing that ought to be covered by an NDA, and I wanted to make sure that this was all okay. I was honestly trying to look out for Liam, and as you can see here, I even said to him, and huh? So the NDA, I'm trying to understand what it even covers. You were able to tell me a pretty staggering amount just now. As you can see, I was confused. If Liam was able to tell me all this stuff, what did the NDA cover? It's since been deleted, and I'm not sure if I have a screenshot of it, it just wasn't important to the video, but Liam responded explaining that the NDA only covered the specifics of the numbers. How much money they were asking Scott for, how much Scott was counteroffering, that kind of stuff. And to Jelly Liam's credit, he never told me any numbers. Honestly, I'm still skeptical that any of the statements in my video could have realistically been in violation of Liam's NDA, but whatever. It's here that I need to point out a critical detail. Detail. I am not the one who signed an NDA. I'm a YouTuber that Jelly Liam voluntarily agreed to speak with and told all this stuff to. It's not my obligation to uphold Liam's NDA with Scott, and to be perfectly honest, most journalists would not go as far as I did to accommodate their interviewee. Most wouldn't draw attention to the fact that this person might be saying too much. Why miss out on a controversial quote? That can be a valuable commodity to an opportunistic YouTuber. Just look at the amount of people making drama videos that capitalize on my controversy. I had no obligation obligation to Liam's NDA, but as you can see, I was trying to be respectful of it. I didn't want Liam to get in any legal trouble over my video. It was the first thing I said to Notori, it was the first thing I brought up to Liam, and I even brought it up again here after Liam started going into such sensitive details. I was constantly going out of my way to confirm that this was all okay to talk about, but make no mistake, this was still my video, not Jelly Liam's. Nobody made him participate in it, nobody made him say the things he said to me, a reporter. Liam chose to. Despite all that, I'm never trying to be an asshole, and I'm confident that everyone I have interviewed, Baddington, Eckercoaster, Enchanted Mob, Ramanov, and even Fiznom would confirm that I've conducted myself professionally and appropriately in our interviews. There's also this ridiculous implication that I went into this interview with an agenda, that I had some goal of getting Jelly Liam to talk a bunch of shit about Scott and the fanverse. Not only is that false, but the argument doesn't actually hold up to scrutiny. It makes no sense. For one thing, you can see that none of my questions were negative or baiting or focused on drama or anything like that. They were normal basic questions you would ask a game developer. All my messages are still there and I have nothing to hide. You can see the questions I was asking for yourself. How long did you spend on that first prototype that you sent to Scott? How much gameplay was in that initial prototype? Before I spoke to Liam, I had no idea what went on during Aftonbilt's development. I had no idea that they went through this crappy situation and that they were somewhat resentful of Scott and the fanverse. How could I have known that? Nobody knew that. How could I have been going for an angle that I didn't even know existed until after I did the interview? I can't read someone's mind or drag the words out of someone's mouth. I can't make anyone tell me anything. It is true that Liam came off as very salty and negative in my Aftonbilt video, but that's because he threw a bunch of shade and made a bunch of negative statements during the interview. It's not because I set out with the intention of getting that kind of information. I wouldn't have even known to look for it. Finally, Liam and I's interview concluded. I would be up for 24 hours straight, writing the script, recording the voiceover, editing the voiceover, assembling the footage, then editing the video on my crappy $500 Lenovo laptop with 12 gigs of free space. I'm not kidding, I seriously edited my first 30 videos on that piece of crap. I pulled an all-nighter, and the next morning my video was done. I was incredibly proud of it, and I still am. I uploaded it, and as a courtesy, I showed it to Liam. Remember, I had no obligation to do this. This is my video. Liam chose to speak to me, and I had just spent hours and hours working, creating it. Despite that, and despite what recent statements might suggest, I'm not a monster, and I still wanted to make sure that I wasn't misrepresenting anything that Liam had said. Liam told me that everything looked good, that all the information was factual, the video was ready to go, it was uploaded, the thumbnail was done, the subtitles were done, I was at the finish line. However, as you can see in one of the few messages that Liam didn't delete, at the last second he asked if we could delay the video. 
he wanted to show it to one of his other team members first and that they would be out of class in a half an hour. I was taken aback by this request. I had agreed to let Liam see the video ahead of time since it was all based on his statements and I wanted him to fact check it. Now though, he was suggesting that we needed the approval of someone else who I hadn't spoken to and who hadn't come up at all in the interview. If Liam had an issue with the contents of the video and said, you know, oh, can you cut this line out and stuff like that, I of course would have done it. That doesn't suddenly become my obligation simply because Liam volunteered to speak to me. I did it because I was trying to be nice and accommodate him. And as yet another courtesy to Liam, I agreed to delay the video's release and allow this team member to see it ahead of time. Shortly after, I got the following message from Liam. She wants me to run it by Scott's lawyers first to make sure it clears NDA. Uh, are you kidding me? This was obviously an unacceptable proposal that I would never ever agree to. Liam was effectively asking me to completely throw away my video that I'd worked really hard on and was really proud of. If, at the start of our interview, Liam had said, hey, sure, I'll speak with you, but any video you make needs to be cleared by Scott's lawyers first, I would never have agreed to the interview in the first place because the video would have never come out. You wouldn't run this kind of thing by Scott's lawyers anyway, they're just gonna say no. If anything, you'd run it by your own lawyer who works for you. They would look at your statements, then look at the NDA, and they would tell you if they felt the statements were in breach of it. Again though, it was always Liam's responsibility to ensure that he didn't violate his own agreements, not mine. Asking me to send my video that I've slaved over to Scott's lawyers was just not acceptable, it was non-negotiable, and yes, I made that clear to Liam in my response. I stand by that. It was not reasonable to effectively ask me to scrap all of my work moments before it was set to release. I'd done everything I could to accommodate Liam, but I had to put my foot down at this request. I've demonstrated how up until this point I had been incredibly courteous to Jelly Liam. I frequently reminded him that he was under NDA, knowing that I could potentially miss out on a really juicy exclusive as a result. Every time he reassured me that he was in the clear, that I was free to include everything in the video. It's especially ironic that Liam requested this because the whole Afton built story was that Liam and his team worked hard on the project only for Scott to pull a last minute switcheroo and try to change the terms of their agreement after they'd negotiated it. They put in a bunch of effort only to see their project collapse right when it all looked like it was coming together. Now Liam was trying to do the same thing to me, change our agreement at the last second in a way that completely destroyed all of my efforts. It felt really disrespectful to the huge amount of work that goes into a video like this. I negotiated with Liam to find some sort of compromise. I wasn't going to scrap my video, but as I said from the start, I was willing to make any specific alterations and cut anything that Liam thought might violate his NDA. My priority and obligation to Liam was that he didn't get in legal trouble, and thankfully he didn't. Liam ended up rereading his contract and determining that Scott couldn't pursue him for monetary damages. Shortly after this, at 3.54pm, exactly 30 minutes before the video would go live, Liam said the following. Okay, so I ran through it. I'd say publish when you're ready. I'm holding my heart that Scott himself doesn't see it, since everything covered is still a thin line between what we can and can't say, but the worst he can do is tell me to stop telling people about it. With Liam having signed off on the video and confident that it wouldn't result in any legal jeopardy for him, I released Aftonbilt, the fall of a FNAF fan game. I'd had some pretty successful video launches before, but nothing that had come close to this. After only like two hours, the video had nearly 100,000 views. It was by far my most successful video yet, and I'm still incredibly proud of it to this day. Furthermore, the reception to the video was incredibly positive. I was thrilled that so many people enjoyed it and found it interesting, but I was also happy to see that viewers were overwhelmingly sympathetic towards Liam and his team. Some were not as sympathetic though. Some felt that by expressing his negative opinions, Liam had somehow harmed FNAF or harmed the fanverse or something. I disagree with this. Most people were able to sympathize with Liam and his team, yet at the same time understand that Scott is running a business here and surely has his own side to the story. However, nobody could dispute the accuracy of Liam's factual statements about their project, the timeline, and the negotiations. Several other members of the Aftonbilt team independently corroborated Liam's claims, explaining that while they didn't agree with all of his controversial opinions about the fanverse, they did experience the events as Liam described. The delays, the poor communication, the last minute contract switcheroos, everyone confirmed that all of it happened. That's the truth. Liam had a right to put their story out there if he wanted to, and apparently he did. If he didn't, he wouldn't have spoken to me and said all those things knowing that I intended to put it in a video and I would try to promote that video as much as possible. While I was thrilled with the video's performance, Liam was starting to freak out and I wasn't actually that surprised when he asked me to take down the video. The truth is that it was far, far too late to do anything at this point. The video had been up for hours and it had already been seen by over 100,000 people. It hit the YouTube trending tab. 
Even if I had been willing to remove what was now my most successful video ever, the Streisand effect likely would have resulted in the news spreading even further. That's what happens when you try to suppress news after it's already broken and gone viral. The cat was out of the bag at this point, and removing the video then would have changed nothing. It was obviously not something that I was going to agree to. More than that though, I was confused. What had changed? Liam had seen the video ahead of time and given me the go-ahead to release it hours ago. What was he suddenly afraid of? The series of events that would transpire next are so insane you wouldn't believe me if I didn't have all the screenshots proving this. People really don't want this video up. Some important people. The video is out, I mean, I am aware, but people are threatening to report me to Scott for him to take legal action. Liam went on to clarify that these important people were other fanverse developers. For the sake of all the fanverse developers, I need to say right now that this was a lie. No fanverse developer ever threatened Liam, and I will prove this shortly. Even after hearing this explanation though, I was still confused. Like I said before, Liam had seen the video ahead of time and approved it, confident that he hadn't broken his NDA. What were these people allegedly threatening to report him to Scott for? Liam claimed that the problem was the word Discord. I'm serious, the word Discord. So at one point in the video, I explained how the Aftonbuilt team eventually got into a Discord chat with officials from Click Team. Apparently, that technically wasn't public information. This is really silly because it's just obviously not a big deal. Click Team's involvement with the fanverse was already publicly known, and some of their reps being in a Discord with some of the proposed developers isn't like some big secret that Scott would sue someone over. It doesn't make any sense. It's just not sensitive information. As bizarre as this was, I had no reason to doubt Liam, and when someone tells you that they're in some sort of danger or that they're the victim of something, you have to believe them. If it turns out to have been a false alarm or whatever, the worst thing that happens is you look silly. More on that later. I believed Jelly Liam when he told me that he was being threatened, and considering it takes several hours to process an edit to a YouTube video, I thought that time was of the essence. Don't get me wrong, I never want to cut something out of a video after the fact, but as I've demonstrated here, I was truly doing everything I could to accommodate Liam. Thus, despite my reservations, I agreed to cut the word Discord out of the video. When I did, I had to edit the description to explain why there was a cut in the video, otherwise it would look like I had screwed up and included something that I shouldn't have and that's not what happened. I made a pretty strong statement telling anyone who might be bothering Liam to leave him alone. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, Liam had lied to me, and when it came out that nobody had actually threatened him, it made me look like a fucking idiot for cutting this trivial stuff out of my video and publicly defending Liam from these imaginary people who weren't actually threatening him. I can prove all this too. Here's a statement from Aftonbuilt's community manager, Notori Sky. As of recording at least, it's still up on their Twitter, though based on recent behavior, I have no doubt that it will be deleted promptly. I actually got to know Notori in the period following the Aftonbuilt video. We spoke somewhat regularly, and I considered them a friend. Regardless of these last few weeks, I found Notori to be a very friendly person, and all my interactions with them were extremely positive. I don't have anything bad to say about them. And nothing in this video should be perceived as criticizing them. The fact that Jelly Liam tried to throw the other Fanverse members under the bus with his message to Theft King saying that Fanverse devs are threatening him, I can confirm that the message he said was out of panic and a lie. That lie was never supposed to be revealed to the public. Theft King posted it because he worried for Liam and wanted people to stop attacking him, even though that wasn't true. This is exactly right. I truly believed Liam was being threatened, and I thought that I was helping him by telling these people to leave him alone. I agree with Notori that Liam probably didn't intend to cause the damage that he did with this lie, but it still sucked. When I found out that it was false, I quickly updated my statement making that clear, but that didn't undo the damage. It still ended up making me look really stupid, and it also created a bunch of tension between me and some fanverse developers who were rightfully taken aback by the false notion that any of them had been threatening Liam when they hadn't been. To this day, I believe that this fabrication was the origin of a lot of the conflict between myself and some members of the fan game scene. Consider also that Notori Sky posted this months after the video was released. In the same statement, they explained that they and the rest of their team still talk to Liam all the time. If I had acted the way that Liam's tweets implied I did during our interview, why would his close friend and team member have made a statement defending me like this? They're literally Liam's PR person, they were constantly in touch with him and they surely knew everything that went down between him and I. If I had really bribed or strong-armed or acted unprofessionally at all during my interactions with Liam, surely Notori wouldn't have made this statement statement defending me in my video months after the fact. Regardless, the reality is that Liam lied to me and told me that fanverse developers were threatening him in the hopes that it would somehow compel me to take the video down. When I obviously refused and instead offered to cut out the problematic utterance of the word discord as a compromise, Liam went ahead and asked me to do it. 
He knew full well that he wasn't actually being threatened. He knew full well that he was asking me to cut this word out for no reason. His lie is what compelled me to go ahead and make a statement defending him, and yeah, like I said before, it made me look like a fucking idiot for going to bat for him over a deception. Liam would never respond to me again after this. All of my further communications with the Aftonbilt team were via community manager Notori Sky. Most important of all, though, is one of the things Liam put forth in his recent allegations. In this message, I offer to compensate Liam for his time taking the interview with me. Liam is trying to insinuate that this was some sort of bribe, but that's just not the case at all, and I can prove it. I did offer Liam a portion of the video's revenue, but as you can see here, it wasn't until long after the video had already come out. See, I was thrilled with the video's reception, but I recognized that Liam was really stressed out. I saw that he regretted some of the things that he had said, and while yeah, it was way too late for me to be willing to delete what would go on to become my most successful video, but I did feel bad and I wanted to do something nice for him. It was not a bribe, as some have suggested. I didn't need anything from Liam at this point. If I was trying to bribe him, then what on earth was I trying to bribe him for? Our hours after the video had already been released. Liam is suggesting that I was trying to bribe him so that he'd stop asking me to take the video down, but the truth is, Liam had no power to take the video down. If I was really the horrible person that he suggests, I would have just blocked him and been done with it. The allegation just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. What did I have to gain by coercing him with money? The video was already a huge success. In fact, after Liam turned my offer down, I reached back out to Aftonbilt's community manager, Notori Sky, and said the following. I spoke with Liam about this yesterday, but they tried to turn me down. Does the Gelatin team have any sort of PayPal or account associated with them? Obviously not in regards to Aftonbilt, since I know that was one of the specific clauses of the contract, but maybe one more generically associated with the team? I went to Notori to see if there was some sort of Gelatin team account that I could send some of the video's revenue to. I felt a little awkward that the Aftonbilt team had gone through this crappy experience, and now my video was going to make me a lot of money from it. While it was my video, and I'm the one who put the work into writing, recording, and editing it, I couldn't have made it had Aftonbilt never been a thing, and I felt like I should try to share some of my success with the team to split amongst themselves. Notori responded saying that there wasn't any sort of team PayPal account other than Liam's or something, and that exchanging money was a complicated situation due to the contract they signed with Scott. Apparently, it even prohibited crowdfunding as an option, and I think there were some concerns about the team members profiting off the project at all. As an alternative, I asked if maybe there was a cause or a charity that their team believed in that I could donate to in their name, and we did talk about this for a bit, but unfortunately, Liam stopped responding to my messages, and without his involvement, I didn't really think things could go anywhere. So as you can see, right after Liam turned down money, I went to Notori and tried to offer it to the team. If I was trying to bribe Liam, why would I have also offered the money to his team after he turned it down? What would I be getting in exchange for that? What would be the motivation? This is where I was at when I offered Liam money. It wasn't nefarious at all. I was trying to be generous. It's true that when I proposed the money to Liam, I said in exchange for dropping this, but I wasn't going to take the video down no matter what. I already knew that. In fact, Liam never took the money, never stopped wanting me to take the video down, and I never took it down. It's still up to this day. So what would I have been bribing Liam for? I didn't need anything from him. I didn't promise anyone anything ahead of time. Only after the video succeeded and I recognized that I would make a lot of money from it did I offer to compensate Liam for his time. Liam had no expectation that he would receive any money at any point. The offer was made after the video's release, so there's no way that it could have impacted Liam's statements in our interview. I was just trying to do a nice thing. I was just trying to share some of the revenue that I knew I would earn from the video, and now it's being used to attack me as some sort of awful person. Surely you can understand why I found that so devastating, and in light of my own recent controversy, I felt like I couldn't defend myself from these claims at all, out of fear that people would think it somehow made my apology less genuine. After I retroactively censored the word Discord from the video and it was revealed that Liam hadn't actually been threatened, he would never respond to me again. I corresponded with Notori Sky regularly over the next few months, but Liam never never reached back out. I wouldn't hear from him again until now when he puts forth these incomplete, misleading, out of context, manipulated screenshots for the sole purpose of trying to make me look bad. In light of how far out of my way I went for Liam, I hope that you can see why it was so upsetting to see what he had done. It just felt vindictive and cruel. I understand that Liam certainly regrets the statements he made to me in our interview, and I know that in hindsight he wishes he hadn't offered to speak to me in the first place. However, attacking me months later isn't going to change any of that. Nobody made Liam speak with me, and as I've demonstrated, I was incredibly accommodating to him throughout this entire process. In the wake of my own unrelated scandal, Jelly Liam saw an opportunity. He posted 
posted these deceptive screenshots in the hopes that some people might decide that somehow Theft King is at fault for the things that Liam said. It's ridiculous. Liam points out that he tried to back out at the last second after it was way too late, and points out that I offered to compensate him for his time, but notice he can't actually say that I misrepresented any of his statements, or that he didn't actually say the things that were in the video. He did. Don't take it from me though, take it from his own team member. Personal opinions said in the video are not 100% something that they agree with. The general story is 100% correct. However, Liam knew that a random screenshot of me offering to compensate him would look suspicious as hell without any explanation or context, and he knew that because of my own unrelated controversy, I wouldn't be able to easily defend myself from this lie. Just like Liam, I recently made some statements that I regret tremendously, so I can empathize with him on that front. However, you'll never hear me blame anyone other than myself for those statements. Nobody made me say those things. I said them. That's on me forever. Liam said many highly opinionated, controversial things to me knowing full well that they would be included in a video, yet upon experiencing consequences for those statements, he refuses to take accountability. Instead, he tries to pass the blame off onto me and implies that I bribed and mistreated him. The truth is, Liam chose to talk to me. He chose to make all those statements. Nobody made him say anything. I constantly reminded him that he was under NDA throughout the entire interview. He continually assured me it was fine. I let him see the video ahead of time, and at the last second, I even let his team members see it at his request. I received Liam's direct approval to release the video. He lied to me and caused me to defend him based on that lie. At Liam's request, I cut words out of the video after the fact, and I ended up looking super dumb because of it. Despite all that, I never stopped defending Liam from those who felt that he didn't have a right to share the truth of his experience simply because it reflected negatively on Scott and the fanverse. Even in spite of Liam's recent deceptions, I'll still defend him for that. His experiences developing Aftonbilt and negotiating with Scott were real, and Liam was certainly within his rights to tell his story. I'll never change my mind about that. However, I didn't compel Liam to say anything. Liam is a grown man who chose his own words. Any consequences he might have experienced from my video are a result of his own actions, and it's pretty fucked up to try to pass the blame onto me. I didn't make Liam talk to me. I didn't make Liam do anything. My Aftonbilt video only exists because Liam made the choice to speak with me rather than letting his community manager handle it. Nobody made me say the things I said about Kane. I can't defend them and I have to live with the consequences of my actions. I'm confident in the way that I've conducted myself during all of my interviews and I do thoroughly reject the notion that I acted improperly in regards to my Aftonbilt video or any other interview video. Thanks for hearing me out. I'm confident that the evidence I have put forth is substantial and I encourage you to scrutinize it for yourself and come to your own conclusions. Thanks for watching.